afternoon call to the second speaker, Dr. Rebecca Starr, who is uh, in the English and Language and Literature Department. Uh, her work is on children's acquisition of language. And today the talk is compiling a multilingual corpus of Singapore's heritage languages. Okay, thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some ongoing work constructing a corpus of heritage languages spoken by multilinguals in Singapore. So my work is in the study of language variation and change. And this is a quantitative approach to sociolinguistics, meaning the study of language and society. And in this work, we address variation at multiple levels of language, including pronunciation, um, word choice, sentences, and so on. Um, and in this work, we seek to understand um, how our language constructs and performs our personal identities, um, how communities change in their language use over time and why, and how the way that you speak shapes how others perceive you, and so on. So this work is about constructing a linguistic corpus, which is essentially just a collection of linguistic data. Um, depending on the type of data we're talking about, this can, can consist of recordings and their transcriptions, but also just texts. But crucially, this is going to be made available to scholars and people in industry who want to work with it. So this is not only of interest to sociolinguists, but also to people working in language documentation, people working in education, computational linguists who want to develop automatic speech re recognition systems, for example, and so on. So one of the reasons why it's a very fun time to be a linguist in Singapore is that the country is undergoing dramatic language shift. And we can see this not only in real time, but also in apparent time. So this is some recent data of speakers of different age groups. And on the left here, we have the youngest speakers, and on the right, we have oldest speakers. So we can see here some dramatic change. Most notably, um, the orange bar, that looks orange to you guys, right, is quite big on the right among the oldest speakers, and teeny, teeny, tiny on the left among the youngest speakers. And this refers to Chinese dialects. And we see a number of other changes here. Mandarin in the red um, starts out quite small, gets big, then is getting small again. And then, of course, in the blue, English has become very prominent amongst the youngest speakers. So what this means in terms of absolute numbers is that Singapore's non-official heritage languages are rapidly declining. In other words, very, very few young children are speaking Chinese dialects, for example, at home as their primary language. And this is relevant not only in terms of preserving our heritage in Singapore, but it's also important in terms, from a linguistic perspective, how languages are spoken. Because the languages, the home language profile of a speaker, shapes how they speak their various languages in their repertoire. So one of the most prominent shifts that we have seen is that as of a few years ago, English is the number one home language in Singapore. Um, and this and other societal changes, in my work I've found that this has resulted in shifts in how various languages are being spoken. So if we take the example of Singapore English, we see two parallel shifts going on. One of the shifts is a shift in certain respects towards U.S. English norms. So we can see this in terms of word choice, but also in terms of pronunciation. For example, roticity, as in R in words like park, is on the rise among younger speakers, particularly in careful speech. We also see a parallel shift towards rising acceptance for local Singapore English norms. So just an example from my work, this is about R in words like park. So here we have young speakers on the left, older speakers then on the right, and we have various speaking situations. So what we can see is that for the older speakers on the right, they use a relatively low level of R in any speech situation. In contrast, the younger speakers on the left are using a lot more R in words like park in careful speech situations, but in spontaneous speech, they actually are using it not as much as the older speakers. So some really big differences in how younger people are speaking compared to older people. Uh, here we have an example. This is an older speaker in my data saying court. Say court for me. Yeah, sound familiar? Okay. And then we have a younger speaker. Hopefully you can hear the R. Say cart for me. Yes. Okay. Cart. Yes. So my work on 
SGE not only identifies the differences by age, as we just saw, but also by a number of other factors, including gender, the social class, including heartlander identity, speaking context, and media consumption habits. In other words, Singaporeans who watch a lot of US media really do speak differently and have different perceptions of various dialects than other people. I've also done some work on Mandarin, and in Mandarin we also see changes and differences by age group, home language, school type, private school versus public school, and also real-time change. And specifically, while some non-standard aspects of Mandarin seem to be receding in the language, others are still going very strong. For example, xi, pronounced as xi, is still very much all over the place in Singapore. But what about other languages? We simply do not know very much about variation and change in other languages spoken in Singapore. And that is because we don't have the data. Little to no data has been collected and made available to scholars on any of these other languages that are spoken in the region. So the idea of the Multilingual Corpus Project um, first is to document the endangered heritage languages spoken here before they are gone so that this data can be used by researchers. Um, another aim is to look at differences in the speech patterns of speakers with different linguistic profiles. And lastly, by collecting data of single multilingual speakers across their various languages, we can compare the relationships among those languages within multilinguals. So essentially the proposed structure of the SMC is to collect data from speakers with various linguistic profiles. So here we have a list of various languages that are used in Singapore, and the idea is to, to collect data from speakers who can speak various combinations of these languages. So there are some significant challenges in compiling a corpus of this type. First of all, most corpora that are compiled in the world are compiled based on speakers who are high proficiency speakers of a language. In this case, we are targeting at least some speakers who are low proficiency heritage language speakers. So we need to bear that in mind, and we need to create materials that are tailored for those speakers so we can get at least some speech from them in that language. Another issue is we want to make sure that these materials are culturally targeted to Singaporeans, particularly because for low proficiency speakers, they may not be able to speak on a lot of topics other than a few topics that they are familiar with in the home domain. A large issue here is also reluctance, particularly on the part of younger speakers, to use their low proficiency heritage language. I think we all know NUS students, it can be very challenging even to get them to speak their mother tongue language, let alone a Chinese dialect or a project like this. Lastly, we have an issue with limited prior work. For a lot of these dialects and languages, there's just no prior research on Singapore features. So we don't know for sure what aspects of the language are going to be fun to look at. Okay, so some solutions that we have implemented so far for this project that seem to be working. First of all, wherever possible, we have incorporated local materials in our data collection processes. So for example, for our storytelling tasks, we are using picture books published by Palangi Books, which is a regional publisher. This is an example of a picture there, so we can agree it looks vaguely regionally appropriate, yes. Um, also, to combat the issue of embarrassment, anxiety, we have developed tasks that are done individually and alone. So we put the speaker in a room, leave them completely alone to do the tasks, and that seems to work relatively well. Um, because we don't know specifically what we're looking for, we've developed targeted materials that cover the full sound system of a particular language, for example, so that we can maximize the chance that we're gonna get what we need to get. We've also developed a range of tasks some of which are more targeted towards very low proficiency speakers. So for example, picture naming of very simple, common, everyday items, ranging to open-ended topic discussion. So currently in phase one of this project, we're collecting some pilot data on Cantonese, Mandarin, English trilinguals. Um, so far, this has been working quite well. So we've got some Cantonese, Mandarin, English data so far. So for the first time now, we are able to look at 
the local variety of Cantonese and compare it to speakers in Hong Kong and elsewhere. So here's just a little example of that. Um, this is one part of the storytelling task in Cantonese, so we can listen to one of our participants here. Okay. So what are we going to do with this data? Well, the idea is once we've collected all the corpus data, we're going to make it available to the research community for whoever wants to use it. And this data can be used to address a wide range of research questions, including, for example, are there differences in the English spoken by speakers with various profiles? Um, can we train speech recognition systems to automatically recognize heritage languages and so forth? So if you are interested, if you speak Cantonese, or if you know someone who speaks Cantonese, and if you've been affected by the issues discussed here, um, the, this is the website. Yes, so feel, feel free to get in touch. OK, thank you. is um, how long, how much speech do you elicit from each person? Um, it has really varied depending on proficiency. Right. Um, we leave about 90 minutes per, so what, what does that mean? I'm so bad at that. 90 to 100 minutes. So hour. It's, been, it's been about half an hour of speech per speaker, but some speakers um, are giving us a lot more. The other issue that we found is that low proficiency speakers take a much longer time on the storytelling task and stuff, right? Um, so although it's a long time, we're not necessarily getting as much speech, but we are getting a reasonable amount of speech from everybody. So and far. In, in, within the bounds of the project, I know you're going to be limited by funds and time, but is part of the goal to have these um, transcribed and annotated? Yes. And, and that's within the scope of the project funding that you currently have, or? Uh, well, we are or, applying for more funding, so yes, that will hopefully happen, yes. We are also experimenting with um, forced alignment for S Singapore English, um, and we're hearing about people who've been using it for Mandarin, and also about people who use English forced alignment to align heritage languages. So we're going to experiment with that, because that's obviously a big time saver. Because the other thing that you might want to consider is whether there's a citizen science angle where you can get local Singaporeans interested in helping you do the first pass transcription yes. with cross-checking between speakers of those heritage languages as a as a like community building exercise because then you get so much closer to the target faster. So, yes. Yeah. But yes. Lovely. Lovely. Any more questions? And <coughs> back, please. So there will be some comparison between the Cantonese spoken in Singapore versus Cantonese spoken in Hong Kong and in uh, various regions, right? Yes. Yeah, so we are working with researchers, for example, Holman Say at University of Pittsburgh, who has done research on diaspora Cantonese in Canada. Um, so he's done quite a lot of work looking at um, the, the influence of English transfer onto Cantonese, for example. Um, and so there is work on Hong Kong and on Canada that we can then compare to, yeah, so. The reason I ask is because unlike uh, Mandarin perhaps, or in English where there's a standard Chinese, whereas the dialects, there are many subtypes. Yes. So they came from different parts of Canton, different parts mm -hmm. of Hokkien for example. So when you compare across different nationality, uh, different cities, there's also a perhaps consideration that it came from different parts of Canton. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, another issue with Cantonese is that you have a lot of media exposure to Hong Kong Cantonese. So with all of our participants, we are asking them quite a lot of detailed questions about their exposure to Hong Kong. Have they been to Hong Kong? Do they watch Hong Kong TV dramas? Do they listen to Hong Kong? A lot of Hong Kong questions and then Malaysia questions because we know Malaysian Cantonese is quite different. As far as I know, there's no previous research, but we just know from what people tell us that Malaysian Cantonese is also different. So we, we're trying to take a really detailed inventory of what people's experiences are in order to understand what's going on. Okay. 
uh, one question. How long, I mean, are you taking this at different points in time, right? Or is this going to be a one-way study? One way, hopefully. I mean, it's going to take a while, but we'll see. Depends on funding, yes. Okay. <clears throat> but to answer maybe your question, there, there is some previous data that we can compare with. Mm. For example, in the 80s, there was a wave of research on Singapore Mandarin. So we actually know quite a lot about mm. what Singapore Mandarin looked like at that time. For English, there's also a bit old older work. So in that sense, yes, we can compare. Right. For Cantonese and other dialects, we're more limited. So we can look at older speakers versus younger speakers. We can look in the National Archive. They have oral history recordings. So in that sense, we might be able to do some real-time studies. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you.